Hey boys and girls, how are we doing today? Miss Wagers is back again and we are working on lesson 12. So let's go ahead and jump right in to our learning intentions. So today our lesson is going to focus on using descriptive details so that way we can explain events in a scientific text. We're actually starting a new story today, A Tsunami Unfolds. So we know we are successful when we can identify descriptive details in the text and then use those details to explain events in a scientific test and text and hint. A tsunami unfolds is another scientific text. It's nonfiction. So let's think about our foundational skills today. So we're working on words from French. You're like, oh, Miss Wagers, I don't speak French. That's okay, but some of our words in English actually come from the French language, like the word um, envelope or envelope. Okay, this word comes from French and it comes from the French word for to wrap. And so an envelope, when you put something in it, it's wrapping it up, right? And that's how we send our mail. And then we also have the word coupon. And the word coupon also comes from French and it comes from the French word for to cut. So coupons, you can cut out back in the old days. Now you have them on your phone. You can just have the coupon on your phone and um, it'll go. But we used to cut out coupons from like newspapers or magazines um, to save money. So we can also use a dictionary to determine the meaning of a word. So I'm gonna show you how to do that today. So the first word in our word bank, and you're going to be using this for your foundational skills lesson on Seesaw, is again, that word coupon. So I'm gonna show you how to go about that. So again, you just wanna open up a new tab and you can search just for the word. So I would say search coupon, oops, C-O-U-P-O-N, and then definition. All right, so Google is really good about giving you a definition right there. So it gives you the um, definition. It's a voucher entitling, entitling the holder to a discount on a particular product. But then you can also um, look down and it will tell you the origin. And that's where the word comes from. So we can see the origin is Old French. So it used to be um, C-O-L-P-E-R and then it changed into French and then French again, and then all the way into English. So words can change over time. So let's give one more example. Another one was the word menu. So again, we can change instead of saying coupon definition, we'll say menu. All right, and then again, it'll give you the definition. You can click translations and more. And again, it'll show you the origin. So it comes from French and Latin this time but eventually it just goes to French and then into English. So that is how you can use the online dictionary to not only check the word, but to see what language words come from. That can be a really cool thing to figure out. So back to our presentation. Um, you, for your foundational skills, you need to circle or highlight the eight misspelled words on the page, and then you're gonna use the word bank to see the correct spellings of the words, okay? so. You're looking for all the words, so like the word coupon is in there somewhere, but it's misspelled, so you need to find it and highlight it. For vocabulary today, you have the word collapsed. And collapsed, it says in the text, the powerful vibration shook the building hard and collapsed the ceiling inside the airport's central hall. And then based on this picture, there's a glacier and it's collapsing. What does the word collapse mean? It means to break apart and fall down suddenly, right? That glacier just broke apart and fell down suddenly. Let's look at our next word. We have evacuation. Children practice safety drills in school. Warning signs with evacuation routes were posted along the coastline. Hmm. What do you think evacuation means based on this sentence in the picture? Right, it means to remove from a dangerous place. So we practice evacuations for um, fire drills and even like tornado drills. Tornado drills, we evacuate to another area in the building, but fire drills, we evacuate the building. You have to leave the building to practice um, getting out of school safely um, in, event, in the event of a fire. So our story is called A Tsunami Unfolds, written by Susan Corman and Kimiko Kajawaka. Kajikawa. Goodness, that one's a tricky name. So it starts off with an unexpected emergency. It was an ordinary Friday afternoon. 
Children were at school and parents were working or taking care of young children at home. Out on the Pacific Ocean, fishermen were hauling in their nets. In busy cities in Japan, such as Tokyo and Sendai, restaurants, shops, and subways were hus- bustling as usual. Two days earlier, a strong earthquake had hit the um, Tohoku region, but it hasn't caused any damage. Suddenly, seismographs began recording powerful new vibrations. It was another earthquake. The quake's epicenter was in the water about 80 miles from the um, city of Sendai in in the Tohoku region. The Japanese early warning system quickly sent out alerts. So you can see in the picture here, we have a map of where we're talking about. So here's Tokyo, which is a pretty well-known city in Japan. And then also we have the Tohoku region, which is up towards the north, okay? And it says there was an emergency earthquake alert. Expect vibrations to begin soon. And this is a seismograph, and we've talked about seismographs before, and they measure the strength of an earthquake. People ran to find safe places. High-speed trains, gas lines, power plants, and factories automatically shut down. The quake hit at 2.46 p.m. The ground rumbled, and a loud roar filled the air. Ceilings split. Roofs caved in, bookshelves and objects crashed to the floor, tall skyscrapers swayed, and roads cracked and buckled. You can see in the picture here where the road is cracked open. Did you know? The Ring of Fire. The Japanese islands are located in the Ring of Fire. About 90% of the world's earthquakes occur in this region. It contains a string of active volcanoes and several tectonic plates meet here. And we've talked about the Ring of Fire before, and you'll learn more about it in our science. So our stop and think question is, how do the maps and photos on pages four and five help you understand the details of the earthquake? Hmm. Well, let's go back one page so we can look at page four as well. So we can see we have the map that's showing us where in Japan this is happening, where the Tohoku region is. We also have a picture of a seismograph that reminds us that it shows us the size or the power of an earthquake. And then they also included this other photo showing you some damage from the earthquake. So that can give you an idea of how powerful this earthquake actually is. And then finally, we have this map where it shows us the ring of fire. And again, they have our, where the story is taking place over here. And we live over here in North America. So across the Pacific Ocean is where this story is taking place. Japan's biggest earthquake. Earthquakes are common in Japan. However, the people instantly knew that something was different about this quake. They were right. This earthquake was a big one, measuring 9.0 on the Richter scale um, of magnitude. This was one of the strongest quakes in history. It went on for six long minutes. The earthquake was so powerful that it moved Japan's main island, Honshu, about eight feet to the east. Imagine a whole island just got shifted eight feet over. That was a powerful earthquake. Then our picture says Monster 9-0 earthquake, strongest ever recorded in Japan. So we can see these little ones. And then all of a sudden, it's huge. The Richter scale, it's like maxing out. It's so big. So real life, Yumi's experience. Yumi, a Japanese woman, was working as a security officer at Sendai Airport on March 11th, 2011. The airport is located about one mile from the coast. That morning, Yumi drove to work as usual and parked her car in the parking lot. When the earthquake struck the airport, many people were confused and frightened. Yumi was stunned by how strong it was and how long it lasted. The powerful vibration shook the building hard and collapsed the ceiling inside the airport's central hall. So remember that word collapse means to suddenly break apart. And then did you know on the Richter scale? The Richter scale is the most common scale used for measuring an earthquake strength or magnitude. It is named after Charles F. Richter, an American seismologist who developed it in 1935. So our question now is how is Yumi's firsthand experience, that means she's telling about what she actually went through, um, strengthened by the details on the chart on the Richter scale on pages six and seven. So let's think about Yumi's experience. It says that she drove to work like normal, um, but she was stunned by how long and how how strong and how long the earthquake lasted. She said powerful vibrations shook the building hard and collapsed the ceiling inside the airport central hall. So imagine that 
And then when we're looking back at our picture, well, we can see how powerful this earthquake actually is. So when I'm reading, I'm putting these details together in my head about, oh, I see on the Richter scale, this is huge. And I see that she's talked about, she was stunned at how powerful and how long this earthquake lasted. So I can tell that this earthquake was really bad. Powerful aftershocks. After the main shock of the earthquake, pow powerful aftershocks kept coming. Most buildings held up well, but the worst damage was along the coast. The quake had damaged thousands of homes. It also damaged Sendai Airport and ripped pipes and, lo and lockers from the walls at the Dachi nuclear power plant in Fukushima. And then, did you know? Taking time. The earthquake was felt as far away as China, Taiwan, and Russia. It not only moved the island of Honshu, but was so powerful that it also sped up Earth's rotation on its axis. That made each day shorter by 1.8 microseconds. That's really, really tiny, but that does make a big difference. So again, here's Japan where the earthquake took place and it was felt in Russia, China, and Taiwan. The world's biggest earthquakes. The Japan 2011 earthquake was the fourth most powerful ever recorded. So it's, we have a table here that's showing us the most powerful earthquakes. So there was one in Southern Chile in 1960, that was a 9.5. The Prince William Sound, Alaska in the United States in 1964 was a 9.2. Northern Sumatra, Indonesia in 2004 was a 9.1. Then in Northern Japan in 2011, that's the one we're reading about is 9.0. And then in Russia in 1952, there was also another 9.0 magnitude earthquake. It says the quake had knocked out electricity in many parts of Japan. With millions of people trying to use their phones, phone networks were crashing too. Most people living in Japan assumed that the worst part of the disaster was over. But for millions, especially those living close to the epicenter, the disaster was just beginning. Dun, dun, dun. wonder what's going to happen next, guys. We already had a big earthquake. So we've read in a couple of our stories before. Think back to our story, Quake. There was a big earthquake and then the fire started. So that was even more disaster. So I wonder what's going to happen this time. Did you know? Messenger from the sea. In Japan, the ore fish is known as the messenger from the sea god's um, palace. Some people believe that the rare appearance of these fish on beaches is a signal that an earthquake is about to strike. Before the quake in 2011, about 20 ore fish were seen stranded on beaches. Hmm, that could be an interesting sign. A tsunami warning. About nine minutes after the earthquake hit, regional alarms sounded again. A tsunami was coming and it was coming fast. Along the coast, people were used to getting tsunami alerts after earthquakes. In fact, when it came, when it came to tsunami preparation, many experts considered Japan's to be the best in the city. Children practiced safety drills in school. Warning signs with ev evacuation routes were posted along the coastlines. Large seawalls stood along the sea built to hold back the tall waves. So wait, we have a did you know here. It says, did you know, what is a tsunami? So if we've been reading this, you're going, wait, Miss Wagers, what is that? I'll tell you. A tsunami is a series of waves in the ocean created by earthquakes or by volcanic eruptions or landslides. The waves of a tsunami can travel as fast as a jet plane, 500 miles per hour. So it's a big wave that travels really fast. And then real life Yumi's experience. At the airport, Yumi heard the tsunami alarm ringing after the quake. Soon, many local residents arrived seeking shelter. The nearby area was flat and easily flooded, and the airport was one of the tallest structures around. Many locals were elderly people. Airport employees and others began assisting them to get the airport's higher to getting to the airport's higher floors. And it says, Did you know Shindo? In Japan, a seismic intensity scale is used to measure an earthquake's strength. The intensity is recorded in units called shindo, which means the degree of shaking. All right, so here we're going to start thinking about the descriptive details in the story. Now, readers can use sensory details or other descriptive language to understand and visualize complex or unfamiliar scientific events. So we're going to use this table to describe the descriptive language and what we can visualize in our minds as we're reading. So for example, on this page, it says that suddenly the seismographs began recording powerful new vibrations. It was another earthquake. 
So right here where it says powerful new vibrations, that's really descriptive. They're telling us um, about that earthquake. So that can make me think that a very large earthquake is causing everything to rumble and shake, right? Because there's these vibrations and they're going back and forth and back and forth. But they're shaking the whole ground. So that's helping me to visualize that this is a very strong and obviously powerful earthquake. Let's look for more. Oh, right here, it says the ground rumbled and a loud roar filled the air. So right there, it's really appealing to both your sense of feeling, like thinking about the ground rumbling beneath your feet, but also your sense of hearing with it um, being a loud roar. So I know right there that something really bad is happening, right? This is not a good situation at all. If the ground is rumbling, literally moving and making sounds, a loud roar, ooh, that'd make me a little bit scared. And then we could also say the ceiling split and the roofs caved in, bookshelves and objects crashed to the floor. So again, think about looking up and seeing your ceiling split above you. So there's devastation. What I'm visualizing is devastation. Bad things are happening everywhere. The ceiling split, the roads are, um, the roofs are caving in. Remember the roads cracked too. So everywhere around me, things are being destroyed. So these are all visual details, things that I can visualize in my mind to really make me think about what this situation was actually like. This is a really good skill for us to use when we're reading informational text to still be able to visualize what's happening to help you get a better understanding of what we're reading. So back to our learning intentions for today, we were learning to use those descriptive details so that way we can explain events in a scientific text. So again, we really want to be able to use those details to visualize or think in our head what is happening. So we know we're, we are successful when we can identify the descriptive details in the text. So we did that by noticing those descriptive details and putting them in the table, check. And then we also want to use details to explain events in the scientific text. So we took those details to be able to visualize and explain exactly how bad this earthquake is. And we also did that throughout our reading when we took that text evidence to explain what was happening on our stop and think questions. Check, nice job guys. So for your reading response today, you have two questions and you really need to make sure that again, you're using that text evidence. So it says to reread page seven and then answer the following questions. So number one, what, what was Yumi doing when the earthquake struck? And then number two, who developed the Richter scale and when was it first developed? So both of those answers are right there questions. They're right there questions. So you can find the answers right in the text. So be sure to use that text evidence so you can answer those correctly. And answer in a complete sentence, please. All right, guys. So that is all for today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Do all of your work. Be kind to one another. And I will see you guys later. Bye.